Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Scubana e-commerce mastery series, where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, we have James Thompson. He's founder of Marketplace Accelerator, which is a consulting company for large Amazon sellers, typically over $10 million. James is the former business head of selling on Amazon. He developed the initial fulfillment by Amazon, the FBA nudge program that helped Amazon sellers generate an extra $1 billion in annual sales. So he is a great friend of, of sellers, e-commerce sellers. He also has a PhD in marketing strategy from Northwestern University, and his primary focus is president of the Prosper Show. And this is an educational conference focused on helping online sellers become more profitable. James, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me this morning, Jeremy. You know, a couple things. I always like to start off with a quick, some quick wins. I mean, you have so much experience in a lot of different venues and, of course, Amazon for many years. What are some a must for sellers to boost sales first and then some of the mistakes to avoid? So Jeremy, I've had the privilege of working with literally tens of thousands of sellers who are selling on Amazon, yeah. other types of marketplaces. And the, the, major, the major message that I would share with the vast majority of these sellers is as you get started, recognize this is really hard to do. Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of key business processes you need to get your head around. You need to understand what you're up against when you sell on a place like Amazon. Very large, sophisticated competitors that you're up against. This is not a little side project that's going to make you an instant millionaire. Mm -hmm. So as we go through our conversation this morning, I'll talk about different aspects of some of the complexities and the failures that sellers mm -hmm. sometimes run into but also some of the amazing things that sellers are able to do as they get really good at understanding how to run their business. Excuse me, as they get really good at understanding how to run their business. Yeah, yeah. So, so what are some of those key processes that obviously the person starting out may start to implement as their journey continues? Sure, so you're a brand new seller. Maybe you're, you've had a successful career elsewhere. You've got some savings place. You decide you want to start your own business. Um, now, where do you start? Typically, it starts, you, you've got somebody you know who can supply you some product and you say, great, I'm going to see if I can sell those items online. Right. I'm going to become that, that instant millionaire. Even if, they're, even if the goals are realistic in terms of, you know, I'd like to have a business that generates three to $5,000 of extra revenue every month, that, that's great. You know, I, 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 I love that idea. Um, the challenge that most new sellers are going to run into is whatever the product is that you're selling, there's a hundred guys or gals before you who have looked at exactly the same product. Mm -hmm. And if it's not exactly that product, it's a product that's so similar to it that the need is already being met by any number of customers, or excuse me, any number of sellers today for mm -hmm. customers on Amazon. So you've got to think very broadly about what is going to make you as a new seller any different from all the other sellers that are out there. Right. So you decide you want to sell some product. Let's say you find that brand new product and you've got some amazing exclusive opportunity to sell something that you, you believe the whole world wants and only you have access to. <laughs> Great. But yeah. there's still a lot of really complicated things to work through. Yeah. You've got to figure out how do I make sure that I can manage my inventory? How do I make sure I get all my orders out on time? How do I make sure I respond to all the customer inquiries I get on a timely basis? What do I do in terms of managing my accounting and my tax collection? my state tax collection, all this kind of stuff is extra complexity that most new entrepreneurs don't think about. And yet, if you've only got so many hours a day to carve out to build your business, yeah. and you're finding you're spending all this time on all of these other tasks that are business critical, legal requirements, and so on and so forth, then how much time do you have to spend on building your business? The, 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 the phrase I like to use is, we need to look at ways that you can work on your business rather than in your business. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of new sellers, they spend so much of their time working in their business, trying to figure out, okay, if only I work a little harder, a few more hours, I'm sure I can get this right. Unfortunately, that, that kind of behavior usually doesn't generate a lot of extra time for somebody to think more strategically about what are they going to do to continue to grow their business profitably 
beyond just a little pet project. Yeah. I mean, obviously you've seen thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of sellers. What are the biggest mistakes that people make that they maybe can avoid? The biggest mistake is thinking that whatever product you've got access to, you can make profit on it. Mm -hmm. The reality, as I said earlier, most products with over 300 million products on Amazon today, chances are what you sell or something very similar to what you sell is already up there. And somebody has already lowered the price to the point that whoever is out there selling it probably isn't making a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. So you come along as a new seller, you don't necessarily have the level of expertise that an experienced Amazon seller is going to have. What is it about your operation and your insight that's going to make you that much better at selling whatever that widget is? Yeah. The other, the other thing I, I would share is many new sellers get in thinking, I've got a specific product that I want to sell, and they become very tied to that product. My experience is that sellers on Amazon who do really well are, are looking at the world in terms of widgets. Mm -hmm. They sell widgets, and the widgets they sell today are different than the widgets they're going to sell tomorrow, and they don't get emotionally tied to those specific widgets. What happens is you sell a bunch of widgets, those products start to do well, guess what, the competition starts to pile onto you, driving down the margins, and now you say, you know what, there's no money to be made on these products, I'm going to get into some other types of products. Right. And so what you sell today and what you sell tomorrow, that catalog has to be fluid, mm -hmm. because if you get too tied to specific products, you're going to get emotionally worked up about somebody came along and stole my products from me and now I can't make any money. Right. The reality is with 2 million sellers on Amazon, somebody else is trying to go after the same real estate that you're already in. Mm -hmm. So you have, you, have to be, you have to be thinking about what does the world of my account look like in six months from now? What am I doing today to plan for new selection? You have to think that way. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where, as I say, people come out of left field and stomp all over your business and there's no margin to be had. Yeah. James, can you think of an example that you saw, just generally speaking, of someone was in, you know, this type of product and how they shifted to another that really worked? Sure. So I have a client that started off selling tools and home improvement products, mm -hmm. and that that was a business they they knew well from a previous uh, previous life, and they were doing okay selling those products, and then lo and behold, Amazon retail got interested in those products, and they started to carry some of them. And the seller realized early enough on into the process that their days of being the only seller or one of two sellers on really hot selling products, that that wasn't going to continue forever. Yeah. So they started to expand into other categories and they, now they sell a lot of office products. They sell some grocery products. They're still a very large company. It's just that they've had to evolve from one particular silo into a couple of other silos in, in order to remain big and yet competitive in all the products they sell. Yeah. So this this kind of situation happens a lot for sellers who have been uh, on the platform a long time and remained profitable for a long time. They've had to evolve over time about mm -hmm. sourcing their products. The, the other big thing that happens with big successful sellers is they start to recognize that they need to build their own brands. Mm. They become the brand owners. They figure out what products they want to go after. They, they work out a sourcing relationship somewhere and get the product manufactured. They build the brand around those products, and now they're the exclusive seller of a brand they own. Now, I'm not going to say that that is an easy path. There are a whole series of other challenges that come with that, but if you can lock up certain types of selection and you can build up customer interest, that's a that's a easier path to longer-term access to products without high levels of competition. So, What's the biggest challenge with having your own brand? What's the biggest challenge? Yeah, the biggest challenge with your own brand, yeah. So let's assume you've done all the good work around trademark violations and you have a product that nobody else can uh, claim is in fact theirs. Let's say you actually have something. Mm -hmm. And I mention that as an important let's assume because a lot of sellers unfortunately don't necessarily do all the appropriate due diligence on that. But let's say you've done the due diligence, you've got your own private label product. The reality is nobody's ever heard of your product from day one. So you've got to build up that brand Let's say you start to get some sales on that product. The barriers to entry for the next guy to come along and build almost the same product with his brand, there's not a lot of barriers to entry. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is you may have a very successful XYZ brand, but some guy comes along with ABC brand, and it's very, very similar to your products. 
but he can afford, because of his cost structure, he can afford to charge a, a nickel less or a dime less for his item. Yeah. The reality is there's a lot of customers who are value-seeking who are going to say, you know what, I don't know either of these brands, but this one looks good and that one looks good, but this one's 25, 30 cents less. Right. I'm going to try this one out. Yeah. And so all that work you put into a private label product, uh, it, it's, it's getting easier and easier with all sorts of Alibaba sourcing and, and, and overseas companies bidding for small batch manufacturing to go after uh, the private label business. And lots and lots of companies are basically fighting over the same plastic yeah. flipper, pancake flipper. I mean, I use that as the ridiculous example, but you go on Amazon and look at silicon pancake flippers, there's like 30 private label brands. Right. Guess, guess what? Most of them are made in two or three factories in China. Right. Everybody's got a different brand name on it. But, but that's sort of a ridiculous example of how easy it is for people to get into private label. Um, so, yeah, no, that's really interesting because it is true. Like if you're obviously if someone goes to your web store online, they don't see all these competitor products and pricing. But if they're on Amazon, they see all of the this one's 25 percent, you know, 25 cents less. How do, right. is there a way to um, with the listing or that you've seen work with just keeping the price higher and somehow demonstrating that this is more valuable? What what works as far as the listing components go? So most sellers who are creating their own listings, most sellers, I can universally say this, they will underinvest the amount of time they spend building the listing. Mm -hmm. it, it's a game. When you build a listing, it's, a, it's completely a game. How do you make sure that your product is going to show up as many times as relevant for customers who are searching for products like that? So we, we have all the data you see on the product page you know, the title, the bullet points, the description. Mm -hmm. But then there's all the, the data behind the scenes, which is called metadata. So how do you make sure that the product is indexed properly so mm -hmm. that when people search for some particular type of product, your product is going to show up in that search? It takes a lot of work to do all that meta analysis, the, the metadata analysis on the back end. And unfortunately, for a lot of companies building their own listings, that's where they're underinvesting their time. And yet, that's absolutely critical for their product to be discovered by customers, especially mm -hmm. if it's a private label product that no one's ever heard of the brand of in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, so that I mean that's that's one major area. The, the other area that's really important, and I think most Amazon sellers have gotten this message, is around using for by Amazon. So Amazon offers a fulfillment service that will help sellers actually fulfill individual orders. Mm -hmm. Many sellers don't need help with their actual order fulfillment. But Amazon has given those, those sellers who use the FBA, the Fulfillment by Amazon program, has given them a substantial advantage when it comes to whether or not their product is selected over other, other competitors' mm. products at, at the point of, point of purchase. Mm. So uh, as I say, most sellers new and existing have figured out that that's kind of important. Um, it turns out that for the vast majority of products, it's very difficult not to use FBA if you actually want to see your sales increase. Really? So, um, as I say, it's not every single situation, but the vast majority of products, if you're going to become a new seller on Amazon, it's going to be harder and harder not to use FBA. Yeah. Uh, so, I don't want to go into excruciating detail. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So, if someone's considering it, you're saying it's pretty much a no-brainer. Like, you should go with FBA because there's a lot of advantages that Amazon has uh, with getting things sold. When you're a new seller with product that may or may not already be on Amazon, mm -hmm. the first thing you need is you need customers to find your product. Yeah. Well, guess what? You've got 40 million prime customers on Amazon. Amazon makes their search algorithm heavily focused on products that can be shipped out through FBA. So guess what happens? When you as a customer start searching for product, you can easily click a button that will show you only those offers that are shippable through FBA, mm. which means every other product out there that doesn't ship through FBA, they just got suppressed from your search criteria. So now as a seller of private label product or product that, that you're just a reseller, but you're not selling an FBA, your product isn't even seen by customers. Mm -hmm. So I, I, don't, I don't mean to sound like a, a, a spokesperson for the FBA program, but the, the That's FBA the reality program, of it though. It's yeah. the reality of competition today on Amazon. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what about, you know, a lot of questions when people are building their business on Amazon, whether experienced or not, they are always wondering about the weight 
of the different features they should be focused on, right? Sure. Like reviews, sure. you know, pictures. What what um can you tell us about that? So let's let's split the world into I'm a reseller versus I'm a seller of my own brand. Mm-hmm. Those, those are two different worlds, and yeah. uh, seller may be playing both spaces. But let's start off with I'm a reseller. I've got a bunch of product that I'm sourcing from somebody else, and I want to sell it online. Okay. So the reality is the vast majority of your products, somebody else is probably either selling it today or in the past has sold it, meaning there is a product page or what's called a product detail page already in the Amazon catalog. So you're going to come along, you're going to put your offer on that page, and you're basically going to be using all the content that somebody else created on that page. Mm -hmm. So... For many sellers, they take make the assumption, well, I assume the content on that page is accurate. Well, let's let's step back and understand if you're a reseller, what's your incentive to create a quick and dirty page, get your product up there so that it's at least selling, and then maybe down the road you'll take the time to invest in modifying and upgrading the page. Yeah. It turns out a lot of that upgrading never happens. So you're a brand new seller, you throw your listings up, or sorry, your offers up on someone else's product page you need to spend time to figure out, is this in fact the right content? And if it's mm-hmm. not, Amazon has ways that you can communicate with them to say, hey, you've got to change this and this and this and make it properly representative of what the product is. Mm-hmm. So not uncommon for a new seller to come on, put a bunch of products up, discover that the listings aren't correct, customers complain, Amazon then comes to the seller and says, wait a minute, you're selling products that don't match the product page, we're gonna mm-hmm. suspend you until you figure out how to fix this. Mm-hmm. And the seller literally, his or her head is spinning. They have no idea what's going on. Right. So th- that's that's a very common issue for the straight reseller. For the seller of a private label product, they come on the platform. That they again will underinvest in the amount of time they spend on building their product detail page. Yeah. The product isn't easily searchable. It doesn't index very well, so customers don't find it. If customers don't find it. They don't buy it. So. Thinking through how quickly you can go from I just signed up for an Amazon account to the money's flowing in, the reality is it's going to take you a few weeks to get your listings in place. And if you've got hundreds and hundreds of products, you're going to have to phase that out. It may take you months to get all those listings set up, optimized, and in a good place where you're comfortable that the product scripts that you're putting out there actually match the product. Mm-hmm. So. So for optimization, let's say someone's been on Amazon for a couple of years. Okay. What's the one or two things they should focus on optimizing in their listing um, or their product to, you know, for the whatever the Amazon algorithm is to get higher in the so, search? So uh, there are, I'm going to give you the, a generalization here. There are certain types of products that may be uh, not consumables. If something is an experiential product, you're mm-hmm. buying a one-time product and you need you know a lot of technical explanation obviously focus on technical stuff on a technical product but for something that's say a standard consumable uh, replenishable product what kind of content do you, how do you want to focus to optimize that listing a couple of really good suggestions I'm gonna go back to make sure that your product is fully indexed if you're using all the the metadata to make sure that your product is searchable and discoverable by customers looking for that you did a great job on that the first time around. Now, how do you keep to refresh your product? Um, a lot of sellers will create one single listing, or excuse me, one single image for their, their item. Well, the reality is if I'm a consumer, I go into a store, I can pick up the item, I can look at it underneath, I'll turn it around. There may be some content on the, on the packaging that's relevant. There may be some sort of uh, experiential photo that I can show. I can show the product in use. Uh, Hmm. I'm going to make up a silly example. Yeah. Let's say I, I sell I sell staplers. Well, okay, there's a picture of the stapler. That's great. But can you show me that it can staple, you know, 40 pages together? Or right. that, that it's easy to open up and replenish the, the staples? Or, I mean, w- whatever the dimensions are of your product, show other images of the product in use, helping customers to understand what, what the experience is going to be like actually consuming that product. Yeah, yeah. Um, how important are reviews? Product reviews? Yeah. So, so there's, a, there's a couple parts to this. There's product reviews, and then there's customer feedback. Mm. Product reviews, where I go on the product detail page, at the top there's a bunch of stars, somewhere between one and five average star rating. I can mm. see 
how well uh, how well other customers have liked that product. There's been some attention recently in the press around false product reviews being yeah. posted on listings, yeah. and Amazon is definitely getting their getting their act together in terms of addressing some of that and taking down or, or reducing the number of sources through which sellers can go to get false product reviews. Mm-hmm. The reality is if someone's going to be dishonest, there are still ways to pursue false product reviews. But for the seller that's, that's running an ethical business, there are very good companies that will help them create product reviews and, and, and get several product reviews on their listing so that when a mm-hmm. customer comes to the listing, they see, oh, okay, other people have bought this. They've liked it. Let me see what are the issues that they're having with the product. I can mm-hmm. read the product review. Oh, this is some actual detailed explanation of what worked well, what didn't work well, the kinds of stuff that may not otherwise be in the product description. Yeah. So uh, product reviews do play into the search criteria that Amazon uses for surfacing different products. When a customer searches for, you know, the, the stapler, here's my stapler, show me all the ones. A bunch of products that have one star, a whole bunch of one star uh, product reviews, those are less likely to surface near the top. Mm-hmm. There's a series of other criteria as well, but but to your question around how important are product reviews, you want to get at least five product reviews on your product so that you've got some initial traffic on that product. Mm-hmm. Now, what often ends up getting tied to product reviews is also sales conversion. So did I get sales, a lot of sales on very few clicks to my site? Mm-hmm. So if I got 50,000 people coming and looking at the product page and five of them bought the product and then left product reviews, yeah. That's obviously not a very good conversion, yeah. and Amazon's going to factor that kind of information into the search criteria, the search, uh, how the search results are surfaced to customers. Yeah. So there's product reviews, and I mean there are companies like Snag Shout, Zonblast, Viral, Viral Launch. Um, these companies do pro- product reviews in an ethical way. You can talk to them about how do I actually get my products. Uh, more reviews and how do I do that in a way that isn't going to get Amazon upset. Yeah. Then there's the other world around feedback. Yeah. And feedback is, is one of those areas that even very experienced customers, excuse me, very experienced sellers d- don't always understand the full gamut of why feedback is important. Mm-hmm. If I buy something from you and you ask me, well, how did you find the experience? And I say, oh yeah, it was great. It turns out with Amazon, it's the quantity of feedback. I say that again. It's not just the quality of feedback that you get, but it's also the quantity of feedback you get. Mm-hmm. Amazon is looking for some proportion of, for every sale you get, there should be some proportion of those orders that are leaving feedback. Yeah. What ends up happening is sellers will keep growing and growing and growing their business. Let's say they're doing 1,000 orders a week, 1,000 orders a day, just crazy volumes. They may not pay attention to what's happening with their feedback counts. Right. And Amazon gets very nervous when you grow your business very quickly, but the level of feedback doesn't follow. Yeah. So you can imagine from a risk management perspective, imagine some guy gets a truckload of stolen product and decides to unload it online, and he's going to unload and get a huge spike in sales. And he's going to get his cash from Amazon, and he's going to walk away before the complaints start coming from customers. Mm-hmm. Amazon likes to see sales and, and, and feedback kind of move together. Yeah. So as you grow your business, even though you already have thousands of pieces of feedback, you need to continue to get feedback all the time as long as you continue to sell. So companies like Be Cool, Feedback 5, Feedback Genius, these are companies that can help you create an automated process for asking customers mm-hmm. for feedback. Very inexpensive, very straightforward. Yeah. It's a great way for sellers, from the day they set themselves up as a seller, it's a great way to, to have the discipline to get the feedback from customers, and you don't have to worry about that anymore. We talked earlier on around how do you create a process that makes your life easier so you don't have to focus on some of this minutia. Right. Getting yourself product reviews on, on new products you create, getting yourself feedback on, on products that, that you're selling today, those are the kinds of systems that are inexpensive and great to get set up. Yeah. They're going to help you run a more effective business. Yeah. You know, James, going back to that example of the of the client who was selling the tools and then kind of went to office supplies, I think this is such a huge factor is always trying to stay one step ahead so you're not complacent 
and then you get buried with whatever you're selling. So, right. and I know you have a great process. You know, I was reading through some of the case studies on, on your site about the development of private label products. I was wondering if you could talk about the process that someone should go through, like that, that client went through to say, what do I, where do I go next? What do I sell? How, how do I know if it's even worth it to go into these office products? So do, do you want to talk about moving into new categories or do you want to talk about private label development? Um, new categories. Okay. So I can't tell you how many times I've been asked the question, well, what should I sell next? What should I sell? What should I sell? <laughs> right, right. And, and the reality is people buy stuff in all sorts of categories. Yeah. And within every category, there's opportunity. So yes, you have to balance, can I source these products if I'm going to be a reseller? But the more, more important question for me is, whatever widget you're going to sell, do you know if you're making money selling it? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that's actually a really hard question to answer. So you can look at all the fees you pay Amazon. You can look at your cost of goods sold. Mm -hmm. But there's a bunch of what I'll call hidden or overhead costs that you need to incorporate into your calculation. So I'm in that my seat here. I love this. Yeah, go on. I've got, yeah. I've got product returns. Yeah. And, and Amazon's going to charge you a return fee. Mm, yeah. On those return products, you're going to have a write down or a write off cost. Yeah. And often those costs can be substantial. I mean, imagine you sell apparel that has a 25, 30% return rate. And a bunch of that stuff comes back to you, and there's no way you're ever going to be able to resell it as new. In fact, you may not be able to sell it at all. It's a complete write off. Right. Those are real costs that add up. Yeah. And in fact, if you've got a product that's doing even 10, 12% return rates, you need to keep a very close eye on those products because all of these so-called hidden costs are going to add up yeah. and will likely wipe out the profit you have on an individual product. Mm -hmm. One of the things, that, one of the discipline that I like to see sellers uh, incorporating into their business is to think of their overall business as not a thousand products in my catalog, but actually a thousand separate P and Ls. Each one of them mm -hmm. has to be looked at and analyzed. You need to evaluate, does it continue to make sense for me to sell every single one of these products? Yeah. So if you end up in a situation where, lo and behold, the 80-20 rule applies to you as well, and there's a bunch of products you're selling, you may be doing huge volumes, but guess what? You don't make any money. Or worse yet, you lose money on the sale of every one of those products once you factor in your overhead and all of your indirect costs. Guess who's making money here no matter what? Amazon, Amazon. still gets paid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... When you ask me the question, where do I sell next? The first thing I want anybody to do before they start exploring new suppliers and new categories is stop and look at your own existing catalog today and ask yourself the question, could I actually make more money by selling fewer units but focusing my efforts on only the profitable units that I sell? Mm -hmm. We go back to the, the issue of the, the new seller spending you know, 28 hours a day on their business and realizing I don't know where I'm going to get more time to to free myself up to work on building my business. Right. If you if you have a thousand products in your catalog, and you go through the discipline of figuring out what are actually your costs on every single one of them, incorporating all these overhead costs and indirect costs, what you'll find is there's probably a couple hundred products you should stop selling now. Mm -hmm. And many of those products, you may be able to write off relationships with certain suppliers because you realize, I actually don't make any money selling any of that supplier's product. Well, if you reduce the number of supplier relationships you have to manage, you reduce the number of products you have to ship out, you reduce the number of product returns you have to handle, you're probably going to find yourself with a little bit of time on your hands. Right. And now that time, you can spend on thinking through whatever new widget you want to sell. So... This is all a long answer to your question. It doesn't really matter to me what your next product is that you sell. Just have really good data in place on what you do sell so that you can make intelligent decisions about what you might consider selling the next time around. Mm -hmm. one, one, of the big, one of the big oversights by even really large sellers is looking at all of their overhead as a lump sum that gets written, written down off of all the other gross margins at the end of the year. So. I brought in a bunch of sales, I wrote off the cost of goods and all the fees, and okay, I'm left with $100,000 of gross margin, except I haven't incorporated my overhead. Yeah. Now I incorporated my overhead, and my overhead is actually $80,000. Well, my profit is $100,000 minus $80,000, it's $20,000, not $100,000. And oh, by the way, a bunch of those products, once I incorporate overhead, 
many of my lower price products, they don't actually make sense for me to sell anymore because when I take my warehouse employee who's picking up the box and putting it into another box, whether that employee picks up a $10 item or a $100 item, it's the same amount of warehouse time. Right. But in one situation, I make money, and in one situation, I just I can't make money because I can't even pay for the employee to put the item in the box and, and cover the rest of my costs. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. So, so James, walk me through because, you know, obviously you've done, you have clients, and you did this profitability analysis, right, where yes. you essentially looked at all their SKUs. Can you walk me through one of the people – um, I mean, obviously you can't name names, but the, the process you took them through and what you found. Well, uh, in one client situation, they, they sell, they sell soft line products and they were dealing with something like 25 different suppliers that provided something like 40 brands. And when they went through the process of actually looking at every SKU, they quickly discovered that there were a whole bunch of products in one brand that made them absolutely no money. And in fact, if they stopped selling that product, they wouldn't have to subsidize that with a bunch of sales in, in actually profitable products elsewhere. So this particular client ended up stopping sourcing a, a very well-known brand that they assumed was making them money because it was selling tons of volume for mm -hmm. them. But once they went through and looked at return rates, they looked at some of their other indirect and overhead costs, they discovered it, this, this will never make us money. Yeah. So they, they shut off that valve and their profitability went from about 10% gross margin to 16% gross margin. It's huge. Yeah. Well, if I'm doing any meaningful volume and I have not only increased my margin, but I've simplified my business because I can do away with certain brands or certain suppliers, I'm in a better position to grow. So back to your question around, well, what do I do to grow my business in other categories? Uh, there is no silver bullet here. First, right. have the discipline of understanding what the economics are of the business you do run, and then start thinking through what are other types of products that will meet those those same type of profitability goals that I have for, for what I've essentially streamlined in my business. Mm -hmm. So, James, when someone comes to you, like that client, what do they ask you? Do they say, I mean, they're probably not saying, can you look at my current SKUs? Are they asking you, what else can I can I be selling, or what what questions do you get? So this is something that, as a consultant, uh, it's sort of a, it's sort of like a timeout situation with a client. I say, right. okay, you have all these growth goals, fabulous. You you want to be the next billion dollar business? That's great. Right. Before we go that route, let's right. figure out where you're wasting your time, where you're subsidizing uh, certain efforts with 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 uh, with bad product. Or rather, you're having to subsidize bad product with, with other efforts. So let's let's have that conversation first. Essentially, let's understand the, the rules, the economics of your business. Mm -hmm. Then we can make good decisions because we actually understand where the triggers are and what the drivers of your profitability is. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of sellers in, in my time at Amazon, the vast majority of sellers who would, would give me good news at the end of the year, the conversation would start like this. Hey, James, guess what? Last year, I grew 40% year over year. I'm like, that's great. Uh, how about your profits? Did they grow 40%? Well, they didn't grow quite that rate. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're still working on a few things. Hopefully, hopefully, we can grow it faster next year. When I hear that kind of stuff, that, that's a big, big stop sign for me. That says, okay, hang on a minute. You don't actually know where your money's being made. Mm -hmm. You're working so hard at driving more stuff through the pipe. You don't know what stuff should go through the pipe and what stuff you don't want to have right. going through the sales pipe. Yeah. So before you, before a seller starts the process of expanding its catalog, looking at ways to negotiate prices with suppliers, let's first understand what the economics are. Mm -hmm. So to your question, very often, I'm the one that's having to initiate that type of a discussion with the, with the, the client mm -hmm. saying, I know you've got these incredible growth goals, and that's that's fabulous, but we may be actually able to grow your business by shrinking your business. Yeah, yeah. So let's have that discussion first, because if you've got a clear lay of the land of your business, and we continue to have that discipline going forward, that every time you go to a new supplier who says, look at my fabulous products, you can say, okay, but you can now put it through through a review process that includes skew by skew profitability so you can make better decisions around 
do, do I want to subsidize the sale of this product with all the hard work I've done elsewhere? Yeah. That makes sense. And yeah, I want to talk a little about the private label, the development of private label products, but I want sure. to ask on that topic, James, sure. you know, at what point have you seen with your clients, does it make sense to sell the, let's say like there's a loss leader, you know, like they're selling whatever filters or diapers. Yep. It makes yep. sense for them to get people to their site to buy other things. What have you seen that's worked that you tell people, yeah, keep selling it even though it's, it's a loss for you. Okay. So you, you've actually asked me two questions in one. Okay. One is, loss leader on their own site versus a loss leader on Amazon. Hmm. Yes, just stay to Amazon, stick to Amazon. For okay. a so Amazon is a transactional marketplace. Yeah. It's, it's not very often that a customer comes back and says, gosh, that third party seller that sold me this product, their products are awesome. I'm gonna buy just from that third party seller. Unless we're dealing with a private label third party seller, the reality is whoever's up there has got a low price, you know, maybe it's available mm. through FBA. That's who I'm going to buy from. Today mm. I buy from this seller, tomorrow I buy from another seller. So the concept of a lost leader, when you go into a grocery store to buy a container of milk, the question is, are you going to come back to that same grocery store to buy the rest of your product? If I go to Amazon and I'm a, a, a seller decides to discount something below cost just to have me buy it and hopefully come back, mm -hmm. that experiment's rarely going to work. It's not going to happen. Because hmm. the customer's not going to come back just for that seller. So this is why I look at the individual product by product P&L. You have to think about the world in terms of mm -hmm. where is my money being made and where is it not. You can't think of it as a, as a shopping cart where the customer buys many products from you, the same seller. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're Amazon retail selling product, the economics are different because a huge amount of the product that they're going to buy is all Amazon. So you can look at that bundle, the bundle economics. But for an individual seller, it really is a transaction by transaction mm. situation and, and you can't look at the world that way. Yeah. So I don't like lost leaders Okay. because usually lost leaders are unknowingly lost leaders <laughs> versus I've decided that I'm in the business of losing money but making up on it on volume. It, it doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. So I'm glad you clarified that because I'm just, I was thinking what are all, what are the reasons in someone's head why they would sell a product that is not making money and that's the only thing I could really think of in that so, sense. There are lots of reasons people sell product. Yeah. In, in our society, most people do it because they want to make money. Yeah. I'm okay if somebody wants to sell something and not make money. I want them to clearly understand they're not making money. They mm -hmm. may have other strategic reasons for selling something below cost. For example, let's say you're a reseller and the brand you work with requires that you buy you know, a minimum of five units of every SKU in their catalog. And some of the products in the catalog, you really don't want to sell. Yeah. So you're happy to basically sell them at cost or a little bit below cost to get them out of your warehouse so you can focus on being able to buy the products that really matter in their catalog. Yeah. In those situations, yep, you may sell below cost, but make sure you understand you're selling them below cost rather than waiting until the end of the year and saying, did we make any money? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So on to the development of private label products. Sure, yeah. sure. So tell me some um, clients or what you walked through with the client who came to you and said, okay, I want to develop some private label products. I'm sure you get that a lot. Yeah, so what happens is somebody has some categorical expertise. You know, maybe they sell, I'll use home and kitchen as a good example. Home and kitchen is a very, very commonly private labeled category. So. You know, they sell a bunch of the major kitchen brands today and they say, you know what, this is insane. We could make basically the same product and do it for a whole lot less money and be able to offer a competitor to the national brand at 40% below the cost of the, the, the national brand. It's huge, yeah. I can do this. I can totally do this because my friends have told me that I can go into Alibaba and I can find people who will buy anything for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not, I'm not a, an expert when it comes to trademark law. The first thing I will say to my client is you need to first engage with a trademark lawyer to figure out for all these wonderful products that you're going to explore, do you actually have a product that's different enough from you know, a KitchenAid product that you can go make this and the KitchenAid lawyers aren't going to call you tomorrow and say, we've noticed that you're making basically our product and we would like you to stop doing that. Right. And now you're stuck with a pallet full of stuff you shipped from overseas that you basically have to throw in the dumpster. Yeah. 
So that, that's, that's going to be one major step. Right. But even before you get there, what happens is the seller says, okay, I want to make, uh, and I'm going to use the ridiculous example again of, I want to make pancake flippers. Okay. Because lots of I've sellers. Seen, no, I, yeah, I've seen a ton made that of decision. Those. Yeah. Many of them have already on Amazon. <laughs> so what typically happens is the seller will do some research and say, well, what are the best selling pancake flippers today on Amazon? What do they look like? They read the product reviews to figure out what customers don't like about those products to see yeah. if there's some product features that could be changed. They look at the price points. Okay, so now I know that there's a $15 retail price pancake flipper that people are saying, oh, I'd like this item with a red handle that's a little bit longer. That would be the perfect pancake flipper. Okay. Okay, so I've got your criteria. You know that this is the kind of product that you can see the sales rank on Amazon. You can see, oh, yeah, you know, this probably sells 100 units a month. I, I like that kind of product. I think I can go in and I can quarter this market once I get the op, 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 awesome product to meet that need. Right. So now the customer, well, my, my client, now the seller will typically go and try to find a sourcing partner. So they'll either go directly to, you know, the Canton Fair in China or they'll work through a, a sourcing company. And there's lots of good trading companies out there that will help them with this process. Mm -hmm. Folks that already know the lay of the land overseas mm -hmm. in China, Korea, Vietnam, Thailand. Mm -hmm. And then they will work to get samples of those products. They'll, they'll examine the products and figure out, okay, what's this mm -hmm. all about? For a brand, for a customer who's brand new to private labeling, just the logistics of figuring out how to work with a supplier overseas, yeah. figuring out how to get the product imported into the country, clear it through customs, get it to them, understand what are all the costs involved in, in landed to your door costs. Right. You have to understand that before you start having these dreams of I'm going to sell a million dollars worth of pancake flippers. Right. So doing small tests, small scale tests, on products that you think have a viable chance of succeeding, that's a great way to start. What is often the case is a seller will focus on too few products. The rule of thumb here is that for every seven products you try out, you'll, you're lucky if one of them does well on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Even though you've done all the same research on all the products, the reality is competition will change, customer preferences will change, costs will change, and lo and behold, whatever that product is that you thought you could do really well on, yeah. something has changed and you're just going to sell through your test, your test supply and realize, I can't make any money doing this. Right. So you've done the research, you've got the relationship with a couple of different suppliers that you try out, you pick the supplier you like, you get the product all the way back into the country, it's physically sitting at your doorstep. Guess what? The hard work starts now because you have an unbranded product. Mm -hmm. a brand that no one's ever heard of, that has no sales history, no product reviews, no product detail page, and I've got to turn this pallet that UPS dropped off at my at my office, I've got to turn that into a business. Right. That's really hard to do. And oh, by the way, all that work you put into building that, assume that in six months, somebody with a lower cost structure is going to figure out how to replicate what you've done for 25 cents less than what you're doing. Right. So... You basically have a small window of opportunity to come in, do the process properly, capitalize on the sales, but already be planning for what are the next 10 private label products that I'm going to put onto my, on, into my catalog. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is all that stuff that's selling well now, it's going to drop off. Yeah. The barriers to entry are not very extensive right now. Right. I'm going to nickname you now James where reality hits hard Thompson <laughs> with, with Amazon. Um, no, Jeremy, I said this at the beginning, I'll say it again. Yeah. Selling on Amazon is really hard. Yeah. This is not a friendly place where a bunch of guys get together and you know set up a big bazaar set of tables and they sell their stuff. That's not how this works. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is highly funded, incredibly data-driven, viciously competitive organizations going up against the new guy who's trying to sell some product he sourced from a friend down the street. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost unfair unfair differences in, in, in competition. Yeah. Uh, I shouldn't use the word unfair. There's nothing unfair about it. What, what is unfair, I think, is that most sellers don't understand just how in, imbalanced it is. This yeah. is not a situation where the marketplace welcomes one more seller with another pancake flipper and says, come on in, see if you can sell your wares. Yeah. This is a market where Sellers are looking at each other's products, figuring out if they can squash each other, if they can make a better version of the widget right. and put the other guy out of business.
Yeah. So I have a question about the competitive advantages, but um, the sure. first the suggestion, any suggestion of companies, like if someone is looking for um, someone to help walk them through the process, maybe they want to develop more private label products, any suggestion of companies that people should look at? Yeah, so I, I know a couple of them. There's one called uh, AP Archway based out of Detroit. Um, they've been doing this for 20 some years. There's another company called Vox Marketing. It's based in uh, Utah. They're, they're very good at doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, I mean, those are two companies that I know. There are many trading companies out there. Yeah. Uh, some of the big differences for companies to think about is in some situations, the trading company will actually be the importer of record and bring it into the country and drop it off at your doorstep. Mm -hmm. And they've, they've dealt with all the complexity of getting it tested, uh, shipped, cleared through customs and actually to your physical doorstep. And there are other types of companies that will basically help you find the right partners, but you're, you're going to be the importer of record. Mm -hmm. This is really important, the importer of record, because what happens is if there's a trademark violation, they're going to look and see who's trying to bring this product into the country and violate existing copyright rules right. or trade rules. Um, so uh, you want to make sure that you're working with people who have done this before. While there's lots of guys overseas that have said, oh, yeah, I've been to the Canton Fair, I can help you. It's not just about the logistics of physically moving product. The trademark aspect is absolutely critical. The willingness to work with somebody who's going to help you test and retest and try out not just new products, but also new suppliers who uh, may be able to provide you with better service or with better quality product. That, that's the kind of experience that you need to be looking for when you, when you go and buy or sorry, when, you, when, you, when you go and identify a partner for helping you source product overseas. I, I really, I admire somebody who wants to be frugal and goes on to Alibaba and says, I'm sure I can just do this myself. Mm -hmm. The reality is sourcing the product is only one small part of the overall uh, set of issues that you face. Even if you get all that stuff right and the product lands on your, on your doorstep, as I mentioned a moment ago, now the business just begins because you have to build the brand, you have to build the listings, you have to build the business with that physical product. Yeah. So uh, better to work with somebody who's done this a thousand times before with a thousand other brands yeah. than, than with somebody who's still trying to figure out what are the 10, 12 steps that are critical in the cookbook to going from a concept to I have a real profitable business selling private label product. Yeah. No, thank you for clarifying that for sure. And there's so many steps in that process. And um, so back to the competitive advantage. So obviously you have a pr unique perspective where you've seen lots of sellers and you work with really, you know, successful sellers. What have you seen? What's the competitive advantages that these successful sellers have? Well, the first one I would say is they're flexible. They're flexible in terms of what they sell. They're flexible in terms of their willingness to experiment with these types of new products or these types of new suppliers for the existing products. So, so they're, they recognize that you can't continue doing business as usual every day. Mm -hmm. You have to try things out. You have to evolve. Mm -hmm. And you have to figure out once something is working for you, you need to scale the heck out of it as fast as possible with the understanding that in six months from now, you may have to pull back completely because somebody with a better cost structure or with a more effective way of getting the product to market has come in and is now competing with you and you, you can't compete with them. So large sellers I work with, they're either very successful private label brands who built a business and continue to evolve the products they carry in that mm -hmm. brand, or they're resellers that have uh, worked hard to evolve their sourcing. Many of them have figured out how to work with certain uh, suppliers or certain brands and do that on an exclusive or semi-exclusive basis mm -hmm. so they can lock down access to certain product. The worst thing about a successful product is that everybody wants to sell it. Right. Well, that's not good if you're the seller. So how do you help build a brand, potentially someone else's brand, how do you help build that, but lock down certain terms that make sure that you're not gonna be competing with 50 other guys who also get the same sourcing agreement from the same brand. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have a general rule as like these top sellers that you work with, you say, I want you coming up with a new product and testing every like certain time period, or what do you what do you tell them? So, uh, I, I don't I don't give that kind of guidance. Okay. I don't say, listen, you're falling behind your quota this month. <laughs> what I will say is, uh, for my clients that do private label 
They are, it's an ever evolving process where they're investing X number of hours a month to continue to look for new products, to continue to have conversations with overseas suppliers. So that's, that's actually part of the day-to-day -day process of running their business. Mm -hmm. It's not a project that gets put on the back burner. It's mm -hmm. actually part of the business. Yeah. And so to the extent that you can take some of these critical uh, longer term strategic projects like identifying sourcing for the next new product and doing a good job, that, that has to happen all the time. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's one aspect. For the guys who are straight resellers, I mean, they're literally going to trade shows all the time. They're looking at Amazon data on a regular basis trying to figure out where is there an opportunity right now. I hear this word arbitrage all the time. Where are there a bunch of weak sellers where we can capitalize and we can provide the brand with a better experience? We can clean up these brand pages mm -hmm. and we, we can make a better experience for that manufacturer and that manufacturer is going to give us a, a sweeter deal. That, that kind of conversation happens a lot. Mm -hmm. And the reality is there are literally hundreds of thousands of brands out there that have no idea how to get their product in front of Amazon customers. And so to the extent that companies come along and say, I know it's complicated. We figured out a lot of that stuff as a seller. Mm -hmm. We'll help get you there. We'll get your product properly represented. We'll get it properly indexed. Customers will find it. We'll help represent your brand equity in a way that will make you proud that you're working with us. Mm -hmm. That conversation is happening a lot more these days than it was six or seven years ago when I was at Amazon. And you mentioned you tell people if you find something that's worked, just scale it. Yep. What what is what works for someone to actually scale it? Are you talking like paid advertising or what? What do you recommend them? Any any aspect, any process in your business that's working well, if if it works well and you've done a test, once the test shows this is working, then make it happen. So, for example, let let's say uh, let's say you go to certain types of trade shows and you go scouring for new brands and you've discovered that certain types of trade shows work really well and you understand why they work well, then reverse engineer that and figure out, well, are there other ways to get that same data without having to go to the trade show? Or are there other types of trade shows that I can go to where I think I'm going to get the same kind of effectiveness? What's my pitch to, to brands that I want to do business with? Mm -hmm. what, what, what do I have to offer that's any different than the next guy who comes along and offers a business card and says, I want to sell your product? Mm -hmm. So that, that whole aspect, the discipline and the repeatable process, developing that and evolving that, once you figure out how to do it, hire somebody that that's all they do all day. Or if you figure out how to create list, killer listings that are getting really high visibility and you've got somebody who knows how to optimize your listings, once you start to see that small portion of your catalog that you've optimized is doing better, well, then make that investment and make it happen across your whole catalog. So I, when I talk about scaling, I talk about let's experiment, let's figure out why things are working, and once we know they're working, let's make sure that we apply it as fast as possible to as many parts of our business as possible. Mm -hmm. When I was at Amazon, we, we, we were basically in a permanent experimenting stage. Everything is an experiment every day. Mm -hmm. And as soon as something works, you're expected as an employee to roll it out as broadly and fast as you can. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is you're never going to get 300 million listings and 2 million sellers on a platform where you know, you're physically calling every seller saying, hey, I noticed you listed black running shoes. What about red running shoes? What about green running shoes? You have to build platforms that allow people to scale things quickly. Yeah. You have to be able to take as much of the human interaction out and put computers in to replace that. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mean to sound cold, but there's a lot of things where a human being doesn't have to do something. A human being is doing it up front to learn how do the pipes get connected, mm -hmm. how does the process work. But once you figure that out, then make the computer do that. Mm -hmm. Because now, now you're basically only constrained by the capacity of your computer, not by the capacity of the human being. Mm -hmm. So, James, what was one of those times where you – remember experimenting with something and it was working and you just had to, they're like, just, all right, James, roll it out. So in, in my first role at Amazon, I, I was the third party category for sports mm -hmm. and we, we were actually experimenting, trying to find ways to get sports sellers to expand the number of products they put into the FBA program. Mm -hmm. The problem with 
approaching a seller from a category specific perspective is that most sellers sell in at least three categories on Amazon. So I go talk to those sports guys and they say, oh, thanks for that information about how to grow my sports portion of my business, but I sell home and kitchen, I sell health and beauty, um, who's going to help me with those? And I would say, um, I don't know, maybe the category manager in those categories? <laughs> And the reality is I, I, was, I was building different types of messaging that was going out to sellers. And I very quickly realized I have to go much more broadly and mm -hmm. look at the business from a seller's perspective rather than from my own category-specific perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I started the same reports I was building for my category. I started building them across categories so I could give us a customer, or in this case, give a seller their overall company view of what was relevant to them. Mm. And in fact, what ended up happening is that that worked really well. And I got pulled away to another team to turn that into a full scale category wide program. Yeah. So when you introduced me, you talked about the nudge program, that yeah. that was something that I initiated because I, I, they recognized that I was doing something that I could only scale so much by myself. Mm. So they brought me over and said, build a team that just does this full time. Yeah. And I ended up sending out tens of thousands of emails every month, but it was across a seller's business rather than, well, let me give you this little splinter of this business, little splinter of this business. Yeah. That's not an effective way to, to look at any particular seller's business. People wanted it to affect all the categories in their business, essentially. Right. Yeah. Amazon, I need you to help me with my overall business, not with some little portion that you think is relevant to yeah. one particular guy who's contacting me. Yeah. I mean, I'll take it. If you're making suggestions that's going to help one part of my business, I'm not going to complain about it, you know? So, um, what, so what are the recommendations? When you, when you started doing that um, broadly across different categories, yeah. what, what, what kind of recommendations were you making or were you having the system make to people that you found that worked really well? So I knew what kinds of sales lift a seller was likely going to see if they put a product into FBA. Yeah. And so as I made recommendations to sellers saying, here's a bunch of products you sell but not in FBA, these are the specific items that you should seriously think about putting into FBA. Right. Guess what happens? A bunch of them take the suggestions, they put stuff in FBA, and they say, this is awesome. I'm getting sales increases. And all I've done is transfer the product from my warehouse to an Amazon fulfillment mm. center. This is fabulous. Where one has to be cautious is this doesn't necessarily work with every single product that a seller puts in, in, into FBA because competitively there may be a bunch of products where, guess what, six other guys also have it in FBA right now. And you're competing with a bunch of guys. The bar has already been raised for everybody. Mm -hmm. So there's not a huge incremental advantage of you putting your product now into FBA. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening is for a lot of sellers who followed by the road of literally line by line, what I was suggesting, if they took those actions, many of them were seeing significant increases in sales. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars of incremental sales in the first year. And, and it's now over a billion dollars a year yeah. just by taking the recommendations of here's a specific skew that you need to take action on by putting it into FBA. Yeah. This doesn't sound like revolutionary information, but we're pinpointing at the SKU level, here's the action to take. Right. And the vast majority of sellers don't have the time or the data to analyze things at the individual SKU level. Yeah. And so they're looking for some type of a roadmap to say, where do I focus? Now, when I was doing that type of recommendation, I was doing that independent of having any idea of what the cost implications were for the seller. So now that I'm outside of Amazon and I see sellers making decisions about products they're going to sell, the reality is a product that doesn't make the money today, they put into FBA, right. probably isn't going to make the money either. Right. So understanding that extra layer today around before you fulfill the product this way or that way, let's again first understand what are the economics of this is product. Is it profitable? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So James, I'm curious, you know, you've seen so many uh, sellers and products. What products have surprised you? on the marketplace that have sold really well? Individual products? Yeah, yeah. They um, used, that stick out to you, they're like, I can't believe this is popular or that sells well. So Amazon, when I, when I started Amazon, uh, it, it was viewed very much as, as a consumer marketplace. Mm -hmm. You buy consumer products on the marketplace. Right. And fast forward three or four years into my experience and I start seeing that people are selling products um, 
what I would describe as sort of in the wrong category, but there was no category for those products. So for example, we started seeing a lot of janitorial products being sold. They were being sold in tools because there really wasn't a place for them. Well, do you know how many hand blowers, industrial size hand blowers get sold on Amazon? <laughs> no a idea. huge number. Oh. Well, I had no idea that Amazon was being used as a marketplace for these types of products. Yeah. A little over a year ago, Amazon actually, uh, well, I guess they relaunched one aspect of their business now called Amazon Supply, which is all around how do we focus on the B2B customer mm -hmm. who's looking to buy either B2B products or B2B quantities of products where they don't want to buy onesies and twosies over and over. They want to buy a whole pallet of toilet paper for the whole building versus, mm. you know, an eight pack. Yes. That, that kind of stuff totally makes sense. But back when we were still thinking of Amazon as a consumer marketplace, seeing industrial vacuum cleaners and stuff show up, you're like, who's buying this? And then you realize, wow, they sold 10 units this, this last week on that item. That's amazing. Right. So, to me, that was a big surprise, but it's only reinforcement for me that as Amazon tries to become the destination for people to buy anything, mm -hmm. it turns out that, yeah, why not sell industrial supply products? Why not sell automotive parts? Why not sell items that you wouldn't necessarily think of first as, as being a place, something you would buy online? Mm -hmm. But the reality is, if you've got to drive out to some weird business park on the edge of town to buy a product... If that guy is now a seller on Amazon, he can sell that same item to right. anybody in the country, yeah. and he's opened up his market significantly to customers. Yeah, yeah. I want it shipped to my door. I don't want to go there. Um, you know, you probably get this question a lot, James, but obviously I have to ask it. So what are some of the, the insider secrets that you can share now that you're not with Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure I would say it, it's really a secret, but it's more reminding folks that Amazon makes money whether the seller makes money or not. Mm -hmm. And so I would describe this as the incentives for Amazon are not aligned with the incentives for sellers. So every time Amazon opens its mouth and asks the seller to do something, it's important that the seller first evaluate whether it makes sense for the seller. Yeah. I've seen a lot of sellers say, oh, Amazon, Amazon contacted me and they said I should do this. Okay, great, I'll do that. Not recognizing that, okay, you've just tied up a bunch of inventory a bunch of money in stale inventory, or you're, you've basically done something that makes no business sense for you, the seller. Yeah. Amazon is not here to be your friend. They're here to run an efficient marketplace that puts as much selection at the lowest price out there for customers. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that you, you're, uh, one individual seller can provide some piece of that with certain products, that's great. But Amazon doesn't think any more or less of you because you chose to take action on a recommendation they offered you. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about Amazon secrets, it's not really a secret that Amazon gets paid. I think the, the, mis, the misnomer in this equation is Amazon's not looking out for the best interest of sellers. Amazon's looking out for the best interest of itself and Amazon customers. So to the extent that a seller understands what the rules of the game are in terms of where they fit in in this big picture, I think that sellers will be a lot happier about their overall Amazon experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about, are there any pieces of data that you discovered that you immediately, you're like, I want to call all my friends and family who uh, sell on Amazon, tell them, but you couldn't because you were working at Amazon at the time. Friends and family? No, like anyone who's, you know, that you knew personally that were selling on, on Amazon. Any data that was, you just, uh, your eyes just got wide, like, wow, I wish I could just share this with everyone. I mean, I, I've, I've seen sales data for certain products on Black Friday and on, mm -hmm. you know, Cyber Monday. And I say, you're kidding me. We sold a million units of that item. I knew it was popular, but I had no idea. And then you feel really out of touch because, well, that product's not relevant to me. Who are these million people buying this product? And you'll see these crazy, crazy pictures. So what was the they, if you what stack was all of these, they go all the way to the moon and back. You're like, okay, that's a lot. But when you actually <laughs> go to a physical fulfillment center, and by the way, I I used, I used to give tours to some of the larger sellers going to fulfillment centers, uh, and that, that is an amazing experience for basically any size seller. Um, it, it's something you can do for free now. If you go to Amazon.com slash FC Tours, mm -hmm. anybody, seller, customer, anybody can go into a tour of a facility. Mm -hmm. FBA.com slash FC Tours. You may have to wait a year before there's a time slot for you, but... Really? Wow. 
Wait, hugely interesting to go and see what's going on and recognize the massness, the, just the vast amount of product that, that is being pushed through the Amazon pipe on a daily basis. You, you start to realize that this isn't just some like interesting sales channel over here. It's actually a way of doing business. Mm -hmm. and, and Amazon is becoming a very difficult organization to avoid. I mean, you, you as a brand, you have to have an Amazon strategy. Whether you sell on Amazon or you advertise on Amazon or you sell through somebody else on Amazon, you've got to have an Amazon strategy. More customers start their search on Amazon than they do on Google. Yeah. So if, if I'm a consumer of anything, including industrial products now, I'm going to go to Amazon and say, okay, how many industrial uh, hand dryers do you have? Oh, look, there's 15 of them. Okay, great. So what are my options now? I can call up all those companies in those business parks on the edge of town and say, um, do you have any of these products? Or I can click buy now and it'll arrive at my doorstep tomorrow or the next day. Mm -hmm. it, it's a pretty amazing uh, option for customers, whether they're B2C customers or B2B customers. Yeah. So James, what was one of those products that sold a million on Black Friday that, that blew your mind? <laughs> <laughs> I, I went into a fulfillment center I think it was in, uh, let's say it was in like November, and they had some of these uh, these Xboxes stacked in pallet after pallet after pallet, literally like two stories high of, of, of pallets of oh. Xboxes, which is a pretty amazing thing to see because when you go to a retail store, you know there's four on the shelf. Right. Well, here's 4,000 of them. Wow. And then somebody says, well, we'll replenish those tomorrow. Wow. That's you're like, crazy. Wow. Okay, and that's one fulfillment center. And now there's, what, 19 or 20 Amazon fulfillment centers in the U.S.? Imagine the quantity of product just on a single SKU that's coming in that's turning around and being shipped out tomorrow. I mean, some of this product is selling so fast, it's literally like cross-docking. It comes in, and it's as soon as it's received, it's basically sold, and then goes out in individual boxes out to the individual orders. Mm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. So... If you've got a spare day to go to some remote location in the U.S. that has an Amazon FC, check it out. Definitely yeah. sign up. Go check it out. It's one of those things you'll walk away and say, I, I, I don't really understand all that happens in getting my order into a box to my doorstep, yeah. but I can see that there's some amazing stuff happening in those fulfillment centers. Mm -hmm. And, you know... What are you most excited? I want to switch gears and talk about the Prosper Show for a second. And sure. what are you most excited about that you're going to be teaching at the conference? So for most of the shows that I have attended over my career, there's a couple of different models. There's the model where either the speaker is sponsored, they paid for the opportunity to stand up and make their pitch, yeah. or if they haven't paid for their pitch, there's one guy talking about one topic. And in either situation, if you're in the audience and you're listening, you're never quite sure if you're getting A, the full story, and B, a balanced perspective of what, what works and doesn't work with my solution that I represent. Right. So we've taken the approach that let's first educate sellers to understand what are all the key issues they need to think about mm -hmm. within each of these major business processes. So accounting software, tax collection, inventory management, feedback, product reviews, that kind of stuff. Right. For each of those, there are solution providers that can partner with Amazon sellers to help them figure these things out. Yeah. Let's first educate. Let's educate customers, or who in this case are, are the Amazon sellers. Let's educate the sellers on what are the issues that are important and why it matters to their business. Mm -hmm. That makes them all much better informed consumers of what they will need to know when they make a decision around what the right solution provider is for them to use. Mm -hmm. And they may decide, you know what, none of these solution providers is the right answer, but at least they understand the major issues so that if they choose to build the solution themselves, they know what they're up against. Mm -hmm. So I want folks to have an educated view of what, what matters to their business, but I also want to introduce a couple of concepts that are a little foreign to, to many customers. Yeah to many sellers, which is going to be around outsourcing. Mm -hmm. Outsourcing is a big, big topic today that is often viewed as something that only the really, really big companies out there will deal with. Mm -hmm. The reality is a small business owner 
who's investing every spare moment of their time in their business, they would love to be able to look at all the time they spend and say, what parts of this can I outsource? Right. Do I really need to become the expert warehouse manager? Do I need to become the expert accounting manager? Right. Guess what? There are guys that guys and gals that do that all day long. That's all they do is warehouse management, uh, accounting, right. inventory management. I mean, these are all different things that no individual seller should expect that they will ever become world class at any of those individual areas. Right. So why not work with companies that understand how to do this well, yeah. shaving out a whole bunch of the time that, that a seller is having to invest in his or her business today doing something that they're never going to do particularly well. Yeah. So makes perfect sense. Yeah. I want people to figure out how to take control of their lives as well as taking control of their business. Their business should not become their life. It should become part of what they do, yeah. but it's, it's this thing they do rather than who they are. Right. And for so many entrepreneurs who get into selling online, their business is who they are. Yeah. I am ABC Inc. That's all I have time to do. I don't have time for my friends, my family, because I got to get the next hundred orders out the door. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I know large sellers who literally manage their business sitting on a bar stool because they built the processes working with the right kinds of companies to manage the data, to manage the inventory, to manage customers, where they literally don't have to touch the product, they don't have to touch the customer, they just basically bring the money in. And, and that's obviously a little bit of a utopian situation to be in, but it's actually not as far-fetched as it was maybe five years ago. So mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about those kinds of issues and having the right mm -hmm. experts in place yeah. to help sellers recognize that even if they start small, they can make some important investments that will free up a bunch of time so they can work in their business excuse me work on their business rather than in their business yeah and, and james we were talking um when it was last week about you know even clients that are doing 10 12 upwards of million dollars a year still have yeah. major process problems and you know you're not just saying outsource but you're saying here's some specific things to outsource and then some software can you talk about because I know we talked about tax collection, fulfillment, inventory, cash management. Can you talk sure. about some of the, um, I guess, options or software out there that people should even look at? Not saying it, it may or may not be a good fit. Obviously, you know, the individual sessions of the Prosper Show will tell them what will be right. a good fit. But just mentioning a few that. Uh, sure, sure. So one of the biggest pains pains in the butt for a seller is tax collection and remittance. Mm -hmm. you, you have to pay state tax for products sold into certain states. Well, let's say you're a business of any of some decent size and you've got facilities in a couple different states. The process of actually collecting the tax and then divvying it up in individual checks that go to all the state governments on a monthly or quarterly or yearly basis, that's an awful lot of time that you, as the small business owner, that's a lot of time you're going to spend getting that all set up and making mm. sure the checks go out on time. And oh, by the way, if you don't get it out on time, you broke the law. You get fined, okay. yeah. So how do, we, how do we simplify a lot of that? Well, we have, at our show, we've got the four major uh, market, market leaders in that space. All four of them are gonna be there. Mm. They're gonna talk about some of these key issues. We're gonna talk with uh, Avalara, we're gonna talk with Taxify, we're gonna talk with uh, TaxJar, we're gonna talk with Vertex, these are, the four main companies mm -hmm. who have to work with Amazon sellers today yeah. and work through these issues. That's a great example of a huge time suck for, for small business owners at the end of the month, end of the quarter, yeah. when they owe taxes. Where do we start? Yeah. Another good situation is uh, a seller who continues to build its business and finds that they need a bigger and bigger warehouse. Mm -hmm. I, I have clients that pride themselves on being able to move into a bigger and bigger warehouse every, every year to two years. I don't think that's the right model. Yeah. I think I think that sellers should focus on how to do profitable sourcing a product, not on how do I become the best warehouse manager in the world. Yeah. So the reality is dealing with warehouse staff, dealing with shrinkage and slippage, and dealing with supplies for the warehouse, that's not why guys start businesses. They don't go into business as an entrepreneur selling online yeah. so that they can manage how many cardboard boxes get shipped on time so that they can turn around and ship out orders. Right. And yet that's what that's what large companies face today is if they yeah. don't do a good job of streamlining some of this and potentially working with outsourced partners, they're gonna find themselves becoming the warehouse king of their small town when that's the last thing they want it to be. Right. So fulfillment 
warehouse. So what do you suggest? What are some solutions? So many sellers have made the step already into FBA yeah. where they will bring in the product from their, their supplier. They will do a little bit of prep to get the, the pallet or the big box ready that they ship off to Amazon where Amazon will do the individual order fulfillment. Yeah. Okay, I call that sort of low-grade outsourcing. Okay. But somebody's still having to get all that product from the suppliers, having to break it up into individual units, get it ready to go for FBA. Yeah. If you're doing thousands of orders a month, which doesn't take that long to get to if you're selling certain types of categories in Amazon, do you really want to spend every evening or every weekend breaking boxes apart and, you know, putting poly wrap around them? Or, Sounds like a nightmare. Yeah. Oh, so I mean, there, there are there are a whole bunch of third party logistics companies out there uh, all over the country that specialize in FBA prep. Mm -hmm. And you can literally have your supplier ship all the product directly to the F, to, to the third party logistics company. They'll get it all ready and they'll get it out the door out to FBA. Mm -hmm. So you literally never touch your product. Yeah. Yeah, you can go visit the third party uh, facility and say, okay, I just want to do look at some of these products. I want to make sure you're, you're prepping them ready. But once that process is in place, you literally never have to touch your product. Yeah. I know a company that used to have a 40,000 square foot warehouse, and they now have a very small office that looks like some high tech organization. There's no inventory anywhere. Yeah. And you walk in, and if you were like an alien landing from another planet, you'd walk in and say, I think they're like some kind of like dot com startup. Right. I don't know what they sell. I don't know. And, and the reality is that's that's the kind of business I would like to see more sellers in, where yeah. the people they hire into their business are really good Excel folks, really good data analysis folks, really good product and, and, and supplier management folks. Those are the kinds of things where I think it makes sense to have staff. Having having a warehouse manager, having thirty warehouse employees, having uh, some guy who does bookkeeping in house. I mean, a lot of that kind of stuff. It's becoming harder and harder for me to understand why people have to internalize all of that and keep that as overhead in their business. Mm -hmm. Keep that as another person they have to manage. I'd rather see a lot of that being outsourced to highly competent mm -hmm. organizations that now exist, focused just on Amazon sellers. Yeah. So, what are some third-party facilities we should uh, look at? Well, I mean, for accounting, there's there's basically three that I know of. There's one called Catching Clouds. There's one called Tech Finance CFO. Uh, there's one called Bench.co. These are three good, good bookkeeping, accounting mm -hmm. organizations that help a lot of companies with with their their bookkeeping mm -hmm. and their accounting. Um, I mentioned the the tax collection earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, with third-party logistics, I mean, there's literally a laundry list of these companies. Um, I, I know a couple of them well. There's one called Swan Packaging that's just outside New York. There's another one called Machilla Fulfillment uh, that's based in Philadelphia. There's another one called Fulfillment.com. Um, they've got locations in, in different parts of the world. Uh, but, but again, I don't, I don't want to omit the dozens of other third-party logistics companies that are starting to pop up that are getting good at FBA prep, mm -hmm. that are getting good at doing reverse logistics, handling all of your returns when customers return products to you, all that kind of stuff somebody has to manage. And I wish more sellers would decide that it is somebody else that's going to manage it rather than themselves. Yeah. And I know, James, one of the things we talked about was inventory, inventory management. What's some good yep. um, solutions for, for inventory management that people can look at? So th this is a Scubana sponsored event. Um, I'm actually a board member for Scubana as well. I have to declare that up front. Uh, Scubana is certainly one of the solutions that's available for medium-sized sellers selling on multiple marketplaces. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of other solutions out there as well. S some very large companies will use companies like Channel Advisor mm -hmm. in, in conjunction with a couple of other software packages. Uh, to the extent that, I mean, I, I can run through a bunch of these other companies like Seller Cloud, Retail Ops, Etail Solutions, Stitch Labs, uh, and, and there's many other solutions as well. But th these types of companies, they all differ in terms of how they solve the problem of managing inventory across multiple channels. Um, some of them are more uh, integrated uphill or downhill with e either the listings creation or with the shipping. 
Um, so every solution is going to be a little bit different. Right. And it's really important for sellers to do their due diligence and say, if I can't have everything in one solution, yeah. then what parts do I absolutely want to outsource versus things that I'm okay patching together with a couple of solutions? Mm-hmm. You know, James, it brings up a question too is, so you know, someone's on Amazon and what other channels should people be looking at besides Amazon? So I can give you a bunch of a bunch of names of other marketplaces, and I will in a minute. But I think yeah. the first the first important step here is the fact that somebody is looking at diversifying beyond just Amazon. Mm-hmm. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. The reality is, it's, it's it's unfortunately easy for a seller to get themselves in trouble due to something they may have done, or may have inadvertently done, or they didn't really do, but they're they're being fingered for that particular issue. And if their account gets suspended, or worse yet, gets terminated, that seller has not very many other options for bringing in cash in the meantime. Mm -hmm. So while Amazon may continue to be their biggest sales channel, even once they diversify, diversification in this situation is a good plan just to make sure that there are other options out there. One of the things that I like uh, sellers doing is, I mean, maybe maybe they're selling on Newegg, maybe they're selling on eBay, maybe they're selling on Rakuten, Maybe they're doing some of the international markets. Um, but with each of these markets, places that they, they, they sell on, there are opportunities for them to sell at different price points. Maybe they've got a clearance channel. Maybe they're working with a flash site to dump stale inventory. I mean, there's lots of options out there. Mm-hmm. Um, there. There are also options that, to the extent diversifying to other channels helps your business, some sellers are really, really good and negotiating very aggressive return policies with their suppliers. So one seller may say, I'm going to sign up to use eBay or I'm going to use some other channel as my clearance channel, whereas another seller may say, I don't actually need a clearance channel because I have negotiated a deal with a supplier that I can return all of my product that I either don't want Mm. or product that I've had returned from customers. So to the extent that somebody manages inventory either directly with suppliers or indirectly by adding new marketplaces, th- those are a couple of different different ways to tackle the same issue. Right. Now, I can't give you a list of marketplaces and say this these set of marketplaces are going to make sense for every seller. Right. Because depending on the kinds of products you sell, some will make a lot more sense than others. Mm-hmm. What I will say is a lot of sellers ask the question, should I spend a lot of time building out my own website? I'm a successful seller on Amazon. Now I want to figure out, can I just get them to come to abc.com right. and buy my products because I'm ABC and I'd rather people come there instead. Right. The reality is it's it's going to be very hard on multiple fronts being able to do that successfully. First right. of all, when you sell on Amazon, you don't own any of the customer relationships. Right. Those are Amazon's customers. So you're not allowed to market to Amazon's customers to get them to come over to your website. Right. The second big issue is when you post your products on Amazon, Amazon's going to start bidding on all the keywords that are relevant to the products that you're selling. So if you start selling on your own website and you start bidding on keywords, you're competing against Amazon on keywords. Guess who's usually going to win that part of the equation? (laughs) So unless you have another mechanism for driving a lot of traffic to your own website, maybe you've got a huge social media following from some other aspect of your business, but unless you already have a lot of pre-existing traffic, the opportunity to essentially move a lot of your business from Amazon over to your own website, that's a very, very hard proposition. Mm -hmm. So it's unfortunately for a lot of sellers who start off on Amazon, they don't always want to be relying on Amazon. Diversifying to their own website is, is probably not going to work very well. And they're going to overinvest a lot of time to try to build that business only to discover that basically Amazon already has, has they have the customers. Yeah. The customers are going on Amazon. Yeah. So to the extent that somebody has a private label brand or they've got exclusive or semi-exclusive sourcing for product, mm-hmm. it's certainly worth exploring where are the foreign markets out there where they could be selling this product. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard of sellers who will diversify from Amazon.com to Amazon UK or Amazon Mm -hmm. Germany. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still all in the Amazon family, but those are different accounts with different customers 
it's not quite as diversified as, say, going to an eBay or a Rakuten or a Newegg, mm -hmm. which is a completely different marketplace. But to the extent that somebody can sell products in multiple places where different customer needs, different price points, I mean, that, that's a very intelligent question to be asking yourself on a regular basis as a seller. Yeah. Do, do, I, do I increase the number of suppliers I go in that I do business with, or do I increase the number of marketplaces I do business with? The answer is all of the above, depending on when you're ready to do these things. Yeah, yeah, because I could see it'd be a concern in the back of my mind about diversification. Like what, like Amazon, let's say they shut someone down, you know, which happens in, that was another question, which is, are there certain key things that people should avoid um, so Amazon doesn't suspend their account? I was just reading an article the other day on someone who yeah. was shut down. And their whole business is shut down because they were only on Amazon. Yep. What should yep. people avoid so they don't get shut down? So one of the common uh, back burner projects that many sellers never get to is doing some kind of monthly or bi-monthly risk management review of their business. Mm -hmm. Look at all of your products, figure out which ones have the highest return rates, figure out which ones have the most negative feedback, figure out if there's some systematic issue with certain products where mm -hmm. those products are going to put your whole account at risk. Then there's the, all the performance metrics that Amazon updates on a daily basis for your business. Your, your on time, your, sure, your late shipment, your negative feedback accounts, your canceled orders, all of that kind of stuff today, Amazon tracks and provides you with that data. So if you start to see a dip in some of those, those, those metrics, there's probably a, an underlying issue that you need to address with your business. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that you're ignoring that, guess what happens? It'll eventually catch up with you and Amazon will suspend your account. Hmm. So I like to think that the process of keeping your nose clean as a seller is not a process that's just focused on responding when the problem happens, right. but rather go looking for soft spots in your business that could eventually turn into something really nasty. Yeah. Are there common things that you've seen that will get someone suspended that's not obviously illegal? <laughs> so, Legal things that sellers do that get themselves in trouble. Um, the first one is they sell product they don't actually have. That is to say they oversell product. Mm. And in fact, when we talk about inventory and order management software, one of the key one of the key benefits of working with an inventory order management software is you can at least keep track of what you have and not not list products for sale yeah. that you don't actually have available. Right. So what ends up happening, if you sell a product that you don't have available, you can get double dinged. First, Amazon says, oh, you had to cancel the order. That's bad. Then right. guess what happens? That seller is going to leave you a piece of negative feedback. Oh, that's bad too. So the same the mistake buyer, yeah. in terms of overselling could end up striking you twice. Right. And it doesn't take long before that, that, that causes a problem. I've seen sellers who will uh, create a listing they say, oh, well, I can get this product anytime. It's not a problem. I'll just say I have 999 units of this product because I can get it anytime. You know, in one day I can get the product, no problem. Well, guess what happens? They have a busy weekend over like uh, uh, Black Friday. They sell through a whole bunch of units and they do sell 999 units. But guess what? They, they really only have access to 200 because that same supplier is selling so much product to so many other companies right now that there isn't an unlimited supply of this product. Yeah. And now that seller has to go back and cancel 700 orders because they don't have the product. Mm -hmm. They're going to get a couple hundred pieces of negative feedback. Amazon's going to suspend their account until the seller comes back with a very clear plan of action in terms of what they're going to do to make sure that never, ever happens again. Right. So a small mistake can cause – has major ramifications down the road. I've also seen crazy stuff where a seller will – Take a product that's $199.99 and oops, they price it for $19.99 and they sell an infinite number of this stuff over the weekend. Mm -hmm. They come in on Monday morning and not only have a bunch of these products actually shipped over the weekend at some huge loss to the seller, mm -hmm. but there's a whole bunch of product that they'll have to cancel and, 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 upset, and upset the customers. So very small, uh, very small mistakes. Yeah bloom into disasters for, for, a, for a, a seller that otherwise means well, but was just a little sloppy here or there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Because that's always lurking in the back of a, a seller's mind is, 
what you know am i going to wake up and one day there's going to be a notice from amazon yep james this has been hugely valuable i really appreciate it i have one last question before i ask it where should we point point people towards what websites uh, should they check out for you so my my key efforts are around prosper show so check out prospershow.com we've got early bird pricing for tickets Mm -hmm. through september 4th february Uh, 2016 February 2016, Salt Lake City, the convention center. It's going to be an amazing lineup of speakers. If you're a seller today and you're trying to figure out how to improve your business processes, consider us. That's yeah. all I would ask. Consider yeah, us. For sure. There's, I don't know if there's any other platform like that that has actual ex-Amazon you know, staff yep. talking along with experts in the field, you know, and things like that. So it looks amazing. Um, So last question, James, you know, since it's the Scubani Commerce Mastery Series, my question is, what should we leave people with? We talked about a lot of different things. Yep. What should we, what should we finish with? So you're an Amazon seller who has listened to us talk for an hour and you're trying to get that one nugget of information out of all this. I would, I would walk away with the, with the very clear sense that being an Amazon seller, there, there is a whole series of important business processes that each have to be identified and managed explicitly. Mm-hmm. You can't just sort of hope that, that certain processes get managed. And to the extent that you're not sure how certain things work in your business, figure it out. Document what's going on. Make it clear that if lo and behold you have to step away from your business for two days, the whole thing doesn't come crashing down because you didn't really understand that somebody wasn't responding to customer inquiries or somebody wasn't updating inventory levels. All of these things need to be clearly laid out in your mind as an entrepreneur around what it takes to run a successful business. Once you have a clear sense of the business, I'll go back to the theme of flexibility. No matter what you sell today, you're probably going to be selling a bunch of other stuff in six months because the stuff today that makes you money isn't going to make you money in six months. So if you take the concept that you are a seller of widgets who has the right discipline and processes in place to put any number of products into your catalog and make money on every one of them, you're much more likely to succeed as a seller and be much more emotionally excited about what you do than unfortunately what, what is all too common the case with sellers today who become tied to products, don't necessarily have a clear process laid out for all parts of their business and get very frustrated because competitors are taking their sales away. Yeah. James, thank you again for sharing your expertise. It's greatly appreciated. My pleasure, Jeremy. Thank you very much. Take care.